Hello and welcome to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This podcast is where we talk to healthcare industry's top physicians, top executives, and thought leaders. I am your host, Summer Gilbert, and today our episode is an Ask the Expert series. Our expert today is Dr. Andrew Wilner. Dr. Andrew Wilner is a board-certified internist, neurologist, and epilepsy specialist. In 1982, he discovered that locum tenens was the perfect solution to achieve work-life balance as a physician and a writer, and he wrote a book called The Locum's Life, which I will link at the bottom of this podcast, Um, and he also has a podcast of his own. Dr. Wilner is the perfect person to talk to about locum tenens because he has practiced locums in a variety of inpatient, outpatient, academic, and community settings. So without further ado, here is our episode with Dr. Andrew Wilner. Dr. Wilner, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate uh, your time. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So you have many, many things. Um going on in your life, it seems like, that keep you busy. You have your, um, you have a book, you are a physician, you have a podcast. So let's just start from the beginning really quickly. What made you want to get into medicine? Well, I think from a a very early age, my story is probably a little bit different because from a very early age, I wanted to be a writer. I knew I wanted to be a writer and I, you know, read all the classics and I read these books and I said, you know, this is all about human interaction and and people are doing these, you know, these kind of people things. They're falling in love, they're murdering each other, you know, there's social strife. It's like, why are they doing these things? And I thought, you know, maybe the way to understand that is to really understand what makes people tick. And the way to do that is to understand and medicine, you know, human physiology. I mean, the way we act must have something to do with the way we're built. That's my 13-year-old, you know, conclusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I continued to uh, write and I kept that thought in mind. And of course, I was fascinated by biology and particularly marine biology. That's kind of my sub, you know, lifelong hobby interest. And by the way, I do have... I didn't mention this uh, earlier. I do have a underwater channel. It's called Underwater with Dr. Andrew. And it has videos that I've taken uh, underwater all over the world, mostly in Southeast Asia, that I've researched and narrate. Mm-hmm. And a couple of them won some contests, you know, international contests. But I'm very interested in sort of the underwater world and biology, you know, what makes the world kind of function. I took ecology courses, you know. Mm-hmm. In, in college. So when I applied to medical school to kind of get to that level of, you know, human beings, I think we probably all of us agree somewhat egotistically are the most interesting sort of creatures on the planet. That seemed to be where to go. And I told the interviewer, a physician at a community hospital, you know, that I really want to go to medical school so I can become a better writer. And I was rejected <laughs> from medical school because he didn't get it. Yeah. He didn't understand the connection. Anyway, eventually, it's a long story, uh, but I did eventually get accepted into medical school and uh, continued to write and continued to learn about people. And as I was in my residency trying to figure out which sort of area was the most interesting, I started out in internal medicine. And at the Long Beach Veterans Hospital, and I studied, you know, you do one month in the ICU and one month in pulmonary and one month mm-hmm. in renal, one month in GI, one Gotta month do your rounds. Yeah. And you, you sort of, by the end of the month as an intern, you sort of have a grasp of what it's all about. And it was exhausting. And I put my writing on hold for that year. I said, well, you know, I mean, these days, you know, there's sort of work limits and stuff like that. I mean, my first day off was Christmas starting, you know, July 1. We went to the hospital every day. I mean, there was none of this work-life balance stuff uh, when I (laughs) was an intern. Yeah. And, uh, but at the end of the year, I was like, I I just didn't really know where I was going with all of this. It's like, it was all sort of equally interesting. 
And I saw that people would do subspecialties. I'm a cardiologist, I'm a pulmonary guy. And I didn't have that sort of direction. And I had also put my writing on hold for a year because I wanted to devote myself 100% to surviving my internship and doing a good job. So I thought, and I had a book in my head. So I talked to my program director and I said, can I take a year off? I'm going to write my book and I'll come back. And he said, okay. Yeah. So I did that, but to support myself, I needed to work. And so I worked as an ER doc. And in those days, you didn't have to be a board certified ER physician. You just needed to be a physician. Anybody could work in the ER. It didn't matter what your training okay. was. Interesting. And I had uh, my medical license and I worked in a, a tiny ER. It had two beds. It was an 80 bed hospital. And wow. I was the ER doc from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, three nights a week. Where was this at with only two beds? Bellwood General Hospital, which is just outside Long Beach, which... Okay. Uh, no longer exists, not my fault, but the hospital, I had to get some letters, you know, you know, when yeah. you apply for this and the hospital is gone. I don't know. Yeah. It's probably a mall or something, but, uh, it was, it was an overwhelming experience. I mean, mm -hmm. I would go to work with a bag full of books and I made a lot of phone calls because I was, you know, treating broken arms and dog bites and delivering babies and taking foreign bodies oh. out of eyes and, and a lot Doing of which I all. had not done. You know, yeah. before. I mean, I sort of knew about it or I had seen it somewhere along the way. But yeah. So, but I made it through and I think, uh, I don't think the patient suffered too much. And it was a great year. But I, what was unexpected was I discovered that the patients with neurologic problems that came in dizzy or with double vision or with numbness of their, you know, great toe or couldn't speak properly. Um, that was fascinating to me, you know, or their memory was affected. It's like, wow, that's really interesting. And every now and then a neurologist would come in to do a consultation and they had this very detailed neurologic examination that I really hadn't seen before. Or if I had it, you know, I just hadn't really noticed it, you know, in medical school that this was a thing. Mm -hmm. And, and I realized that neurology is where I should go. So I applied for a neurologic program. Uh, one. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they took me uh, for two years later. So I was able to complete my internal medicine uh, training. I took the boards. I'm board certified as an internist. Mm -hmm. And then I did three years of neurology training. And then I did a year in fellowship. So I was board certified in internal medicine, board certified in neurology, and I passed the electrophysiology boards as well. So I had seven years of formal training. Wow. Plus my one year of informal ER training uh, to sort of set me up, which I think in the long run was great background and great training. Yeah. Uh, but certainly not the most, uh, not sure I would recommend that route to somebody else, but I think I was a, probably still am a, a special case. Yeah. Um, when were you first introduced to locum tenens? Well, you know, I think I didn't realize it, but I think it was that first year, you know, when I did ER. That was really a locum tenens. Nobody really called it that, but that's what it was, you know. Oh, okay. It was uh, really a locum tenens job. And then uh, uh, I think it was later in my career, I had worked uh, academics for a while. That didn't really work out at where I was. And then I was kind of a free agent, but I still needed to work and I wanted to write and I started writing more and more. In fact, I was full time as a medical journalist for a while. And then when I got back into doing clinical medicine, I balanced those two things. And, and that was great. That was great mm -hmm. because locums, you, your only responsibility is to the patient. You know, you don't have, like now I'm full time actually. I still work some locums on the side, but I'm associate professor of neurology at the University of Tennessee, Memphis. So I have a full time job mm -hmm. and I'm division director of neurology and I'm, you know, part of the day there. But when you're locums, your only job is to take care of the patients. You take care of the patients, you write your notes, and then you go home and nobody wants to hear your opinion about how things could be better or, you know, yeah. or what's wrong with the place. 
And you don't have to devote any energy to that. You just show up, you do your best job with, with what you have. It's kind of like being in the military. It's like, okay, we're going to take that hill. Go for it. Yeah. And you don't say, you know, we could do this better if you went over that way, or if we had some better equipment, or I did this a different way over, you know, my last. You just do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes that's a little constraining and confining, but, uh, you know, sometimes that's sort of liberating. Do you think, do you think working locum tenens has made you a better physician throughout the years? Oh, yeah, because I've worked in South Dakota, in Minnesota, in Massachusetts, in Connecticut, in all kinds of different environments. Um and uh, busy outpatient practice, uh, busy academic practice, uh, teaching situations. So I've had, I mean, you know, people are not all that different depending on where you go. Although in Minnesota, for example, they had a big Somali population. And uh, it's the biggest Somali population outside of Somali. And a lot of these uh, immigrants have kind of developing nation disease, you know, like tuberculosis and stuff that we don't see every day. So sometimes with locums, you get to see some medically unusual stuff, yeah. you know, depending on where you go. But also there's a lot of, you know, systems. You say, gee, it, it, it doesn't have to be the way <laughs> we did it. There's, yeah. you know, so being open-minded is really, I, I, in my book, I use the word uh, flexible, mm -hmm. you know, because you're going into a new one of the doctors I interviewed for my book, it's about my experiences, but I also interviewed 16 other physicians. So it's like being a guest in someone else's home. Yeah. So like, say you invite me to dinner. I come to your house and it's, of course it's a very nice house and I smell the food from the kitchen, but I see the couch is over by you know the window and uh, it's not facing the window, it's facing away from the window. And I said, you know, Summer, you know, your couch would really look a lot better, you know, if it faced the window. Well, you would never do that, right, as a guest. I mean, I might, but but you shouldn't do that <laughs> yeah. as a guest, right? Yeah. Because, uh, and, and locums is kind of like that. It's like, well, you know, they, they know what they're doing. You know, it may not be perfect or to your taste. And, and doctors who don't do that uh, for locums, <laughs> and I've run into one or two along the way, they don't do well. Uh, because you don't have any credibility. You're the new guy or the new girl. Nobody wants to hear your advice on how to make it better. My rule is you have to be somewhere a year before yeah. you give advice. Yeah. And, and that's not, and most locum assignments are, are short of a year. So you just go and do your work, but you pay attention, you know, and you learn. And I think, uh, I think that's really, uh, it's a great opportunity to, to do locums. Plus, yeah. you know, to start when you want to start and end when you want to end. You know, being able to see the end, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're doing the laundry and the pile gets shrinking, you can see there's only, you know, four more shirts to fold and then I'm done, I'm out of here. That also takes a big burden as opposed to, you know, I don't want my employer to hear this, but you know, when you have a full-time job, it, it can be a grind. You know, you got to go back on Monday, you, you know, you, yeah. you, you're not, you're not escaping, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but locums has a built-in escape valve. And I think psychologically, uh, that can be very, uh, very uh, liberating. Yeah, I could see that. And we, we just had a doctor that was on, she was a family medicine physician and I asked her about um, working locum tenants and if she'd ever think about it. And she goes, well, you know what? I really just don't want to travel. I'm really liking where I am in Washington. And I'm like, you know, with locums, you don't have to leave your state, you know? And I think a lot of people are misunder they misunderstand a lot of physicians what locums truly is. And so if you were to d define locums in your own, um, because you have so much experience in it, how would you define it to physicians that um, aren't quite familiar with um, locum tenens and the locum tenens lifestyle? Well, I think I'll expand on that a little bit because after a while, you know, I did locums sort of full time for more than 10 years. And, you know, you're on the plane or you're chatting with, oh, I'm a locum tenants doctor. <laughs> you just kind of get a blank stare. You know, nobody knows what it is. And I've, I had already written three books and I was hunting around for, you know, what should my fourth book be about? And then I realized it's like, you know, I know a lot about locum tenants. 
And also it helped me an enormous amount. It helped me find my specialty of uh, neurology. It helped me achieve uh, some semblance of work-life balance. It helped me fund my 401k. It helped me learn uh, different ways of doing things that I got by traveling around the country. You know, and experiences I never would have had. I went to South Dakota. I mean, I don't even know where South Dakota was. And so I said, I'll write a, I'll write a book about it to help physicians so they know that this is an option. Because, you know, every time you pick up, you, you know, you, I don't know, I always say you turn on the computer, right? You go to the internet and there's something about physician burnout and physicians leaving clinical medicine you know, to become insurance, you know, chart reviewers or, you know, open up a restaurant or do other stuff. I mean, non-clinical careers are terrific, but they shouldn't be an escape from clinical medicine if what you really love is clinical medicine, but the mm -hmm. reason you're leaving is administrative burden, which locums doesn't have. So that compelled me to write uh, The Locum Life. To answer your question more simply, I tell people it's like a substitute teacher. There's a job opening for a short period of time because the doctor there, maybe they're on maternity leave, maybe they got sick, maybe they're retired, they're recruiting for someone new. But physician recruitment takes a long, long time. Even if you hired me tomorrow to work at your hospital, I'd have to get a license in your state. I'd have to be credentialed by your hospital committee. I'd have to be credentialed by all the local insurance companies. A minimum time frame would be six months and it can take a year or longer. Mm -hmm. So there's this gap, you know, and the patients are still coming. You know, the guy retired yesterday. Maybe they started recruiting two months ago. And particularly right now is kind of a wonderful time to be a locum's physician because there are more job openings than there ever have been. I mean, there's a huge need, and no matter what your specialty, I think psychiatry is actually one of the big ones. Yeah. Uh, but family practice, OB, obviously any ICU person, because unfortunately a lot of people in the ICU these days, um, there's a lot of choice. Uh, and then there's, and so that gives you flexibility for your own schedule. It's like, well, I want to go, you know, to Italy for a month. Well, if you're in private practice, that's just impossible, you yeah. Know, because uh, you have overhead. You're paying mm -hmm. your staff. You're paying rent. You know, <laughs> you're paying your mortgage. Even forgetting the price of actually going to Italy, just the price of not working, is not going to be affordable. But when you're a locum tenens physician, you don't have any overhead. I mean, your overhead is your laptop. Yeah, you know, the freedom yeah. it gives you. So it's priceless. Enormous. So I kind of thought it was a public service, you know, to do my mm -hmm. book. And it was really fun to write, to think about my experiences. And I write about malpractice, what you need to know, credentialing, what you need to know, how to find a staffing agency. Do you really need one? When do you need one? When don't you need one? Mm -hmm. You know, how do they help you? And I'll jump in really quickly. Not all staffing agencies are created equal. Pacific Companies is one of a kind. I am blown away by them every day. And I highly, highly, highly recommend getting in contact with them for locum tenens. Okay, keep going. And uh, oh, oh, travel. How do you travel efficiently, right? How do you... Because travel, you know, travel, you're not paid. I would say one of the interesting things about the locums world is you're not paid for travel. So mm -hmm. say I'm going to start in South Dakota. The time that I spend to get there is not compensated. The locums, the staffing agency will pay me for the flight and for my food and for my gas and give me a rental car and they pay the hotel, but they won't pay my time for that travel day. So a travel mm -hmm. day is kind of lost travel. So you have to learn how to be productive you know, Flexible. on your yeah. travel time. You know, if you work for the government, you know, they send you, it's Monday, you can spend the whole day in the train, mm -hmm. they're going to pay you. But locums doesn't work that way. So there is a, there's a lot you need to know. And then, of course, you're self-employed. And so that changes how you file taxes. Uh, and there are CPAs, for example, who specialize in physicians who do locums. Mm -hmm. And I have one of those, and he's a great guy. Yeah. And uh, enormously helpful. So you need to, you're a businessman now. You're working for yourself, which is very different than just showing up every day and getting your paycheck every two weeks. Yeah. Which isn't a bad thing, 
but it's a different thing. Would you recommend uh, medical students just getting out into the the real world of medicine to to try locums first to see where they w- want to land, where they would want to be? Yes. So that is a great question. And I actually asked that question to a bunch of the 16 doctors who have practiced locums. And I got two very, very different answers. So one answer was, yes, that's a wonderful thing. You finished your training, you know, after medical school, you do your residency. So now you're fresh and, you know, but you don't really know. Do you want to work in California or New York? You know, do you want a big clinic? You want to be in solo practice? Do you want to be an academic? I mean, there's all these, there's a lot of options. Mm -hmm. And how do you know? Well, you know, you can get a locums job in California and Give it a shot for six months, see what happens. The other benefit for that particular, in fact, in my book, I have a whole chapter on locum tenens for the newly graduated. Then there's locum tenens for mid-career. And then there's locum tenens for the (laughs) kind of senior pre-retirement kind of group, and all of whom have slightly different sort of objectives and considerations. The other, the other sort of good part about locums for the newly graduated is very often you have a partner. You know, it might be a fellow physician. There's a lot of physician couples, but they might be a year behind. So you both want to go, obviously, together and start your practices somewhere, but somebody's got to tread water for a year. Yeah. So locums is perfect for that. You can go work here, go work there, make some, you know, real money without making a commitment. Plus, you can kind of explore together a little bit and sort of ease that uh, big step into uh, the next phase of your career. Yeah. The other opinion was, no way, you should not do this when you're newly graduated because you don't have enough experience. Because very often when you're locum, say wherever I did neurology, I was the only neurologist. Mm. And when you're in uh, training, you at a big center, you know, you always have somebody to ask questions to. There's the fellow, you know, the junior faculty, the senior faculty. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of support when you're seeing a patient. And when you're in locums, I use South Dakota as an example. You know, you're in South Dakota. You got the phone. You can call, you know, your mentors, but it's all on you. So yeah. I think it depends a lot on your own self-confidence and, you know, your concept of yourself and your abilities and your uh, training. You know, do you feel that you still need, you know, you just kind of mm-hmm. want to ease into this or are you ready to go? You know what you need to know, you know, because medicine is kind of a lifelong learning experience and in locums you may find you know on day one (laughs) there's a lot of patients and everybody Mm -hmm. wants something and and you're it you know nobody else to to ask so i think that requires some introspection yeah on the newly graduated uh physician's part Uh, yeah and i would add before you choose locums the other thing that's important is some introspection as to why you want to do it You know, the more focused you are, is this because I want to try out California or I just want to pay off my student loans? I don't really know what I want to do. I just want to get this done. Mm -hmm. I want to get started, make some money. Or, you know, I I think academics is for me and this locums job has some teaching. I'm going to try that, you know, or I want to work in an underserved area with, you know, indigenous people and, you know. Yeah. Well, and that's what I was going to say is that um, our locums department right now, we have so many opportunities that, I mean, say you were just talking about neurology, um, you may not be the only neurologist. We have options that say, you know, you'll have a full support staff and you'll be working with a multi-specialty group or, you know, um, and so um, these days you just have a bigger option. I think locums has grown so much that it gives a physician so much um, choice, you know, to choose where they want to go, where they want to be, how long they want to be there. And you oh, yeah, know, I think you know, the choices are amazing. In fact, a neurology job turned up about a year ago in uh, New Zealand. And uh, but I couldn't convince my wife <laughs> to go to New Zealand for a year. But uh, if I was too single, still single, I think I would have uh, definitely gone yeah. to uh, New Zealand. They don't, they don't pay very much in New Zealand, but just just for the experience, you mm-hmm. know, you have it, it's different being uh, 
a tourist, right, than actually living yeah. and working in a place. And I always hear good things about New Zealand. So, but I think that's an opportunity that looks like it's going to pass me by. Yeah. Uh, but Locus so, is a great way also to, to travel if you want to. So, Andrew, where can we get your book? We're almost running out of time here. So tell us where we can get your, your Locum's Life book. Ah, so really the best way to uh, get the book is to go to my website, which is andrewwilner.com. Okay. And I have a lot of other Locum's resources there. And you can contact me there if you have a question, if you uh, want a referral to uh, Locum's agency, or you want a referral to my uh, CPA or, you know, someone who can help you. Uh, I'm very happy to respond to questions. I don't charge anything. I feel that it's like a medical, you know, helping mm -hmm. humanity. I'm willing to sort of give anybody who wants 15 minutes of my uh, time. And of course, the book is on uh, Amazon. And I also did an audible book version of a couple people had asked me for that. So if you like listening to books while you're driving or working out, it's on audible.com yeah. or you can get the uh, audible version on Amazon also. All right. And then what about the art of medicine, your podcast? Tell us how, how to listen to that. Yeah. So the art of medicine is on your favorite podcast player, you know, Apple, Google, Spotify, whichever one. I haven't taken it off Spotify. Uh, not that I'm not that I don't have enough time for that stuff, but it comes out every two weeks and I interview somebody interesting, you know, physician, writer, uh, I did interview, I've mentioned this CPA who does work for physicians. You know, what, are the, what do they need to know? I've interviewed in, people that do investments for physicians and also locum tenants. In fact, mm -hmm. had a few people on who uh, specialize in doing locum tenants. And what does it mean to them? Why do they do it? You know, what's advantageous uh, for them? I've, we, I've had a few wellness people you know, talk about work-life balance, which I think is, you know, really important. Some mm -hmm. spiritual people, you know, where, do, where does that fit into to healing, you know, particularly as a sort of, you know, conventionally trained uh, physician. So it comes out every two weeks on a Sunday. Okay. And it's usually about 15, 20 minutes long. And I'd love for everyone to listen to it and give me feedback of what they think, you right. know, and uh, tell me how to do it better. Yeah, and I'll put all the links at the bottom of the podcast description so everyone can get to um, your website, your podcast, um, where to buy your book, everything very easily. But thank you so much for your time, and it went by way too fast, and it was great to get to know you better. Um, I definitely appreciate all your time. Summer, thanks for this opportunity. Locums is uh, one of my favorite topics, so it was really fun to talk about. Yeah, no problem. And I would love to have you back on the podcast. We'll, we'll, we'll chat offline and, and uh, come up with uh, round two. Okay, that'd be great. All right, we'll have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thank you to all our listeners. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And a big thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast could not be possible. If you would like to be a guest, go to www.pacificcompanies.com. Thank you.